What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode. Well, not back, but this is the first episode of Life Insurance Telesales Mastery with your host, Johnny Nidafan. We got Austin Mitchell as the co-host. We wanted to make this podcast um, to uh, to help you as uh, new insurance agents. Uh, really, if you're struggling, if you're brand new, or if you're just wanting to get more sales training, uh, maybe your agency, your IMO, or uh, mentor is not giving you the training or, or knowledge or information that you need to be successful, this is going to be a podcast where we're coming in, giving you hot takes, giving you all the information you need to be successful. Um, and, uh, that's really the goal. So, uh, Austin, welcome to another podcast. Appreciate it, man. Let's go. Um, so we're going to be doing every one a week. So just be on the lookout. If you haven't already subscribed down below, share this with a friend, if you found it valuable, but today we're going to be talking about how to win in the life insurance sales, right? Insurance sales for the brand newest agent. Talk about your, uh, dude, talk about your, your experience first when you just got started selling life insurance. Yeah, I mean, I think it, uh, you know, really where it started was I had an uncle that was in the financial industry for, you know, 30, 40 years. And we sat down one night and, you know, he kind of shared what he did for a long time. And, you know, it interested me. So you know, I took it on, upon my own to really dive into the content that I could find on YouTube. And, you know, probably wasn't the best decision, but, you know. Dropped into a lot of podcasts, you know, watched a lot of three letter named channels and, you know, it was, it was good, honestly. I mean, back at that time though, there was a lot of hype Yep. and there was a lot of, you know, maybe misconstrued numbers as far as what people were actually making a month. And I fell for the, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid <laughs> as they say. So it's all good though. I ended up joining an agency you know, I, I did write a few policies, but I really struggled to to be profitable, face some massive chargebacks my first month in the business. Yeah. And were you in home or telesales at that point? In home. Yeah. Okay. So it was it was it was kind of a combination of both, right? My first massive chargeback came from a telesales call, but I was trying to go in home and you know, I was driving, you know, 30 minutes to an hour away to hit those in-home appointments. And I was just getting absolutely crushed right by the nose. Yeah. I was just getting torched, man. And, uh, yeah, I, like I said, I wrote a few policies. It was cool, but never really caught a lot of traction. And so fast forward, you know, a couple different agencies later and, you know, blaming the agency for the problems Classic. that I was having, taking self accountability. Yep. Uh, we kind of connected and started generating my own leads and, you know, really learning to grow as a business owner and, it's when it kind of took off, man. Yeah, bro, for sure. I, I remember my first start uh, in the insurance space. I actually started cold door knocking um, business to business to business. This was before selling life insurance. But this is how I got my start in the insurance industry. Actually, fast forward, uh, take it two steps back. My uh, father-in-law actually introduced me to the business, and uh, he really helped me out get, get my start. Um, I had to figure out, like, hey, I just got married, and uh, I got to provide for my wife some way. And so... Um, I was working at Starbucks at that time, took my test a week and a half and uh, got licensed. And uh, yeah, I, I started selling selling insurance in, in uh, business to business, just cold door knocking 30 to 40 per day, uh, which was nuts. Um, but I uh, did that consistently and then uh, found, I, I was listening to a ton of podcasts and uh, heard about life insurance and telesales. And so I just got started. Jump started at that point, but my first three three weeks were absolutely brutal. Set at some appointments, didn't show up. When I did present, it was horrible presentation. I didn't know my script. I didn't I didn't know anything. I knew how to book appointments, but that's pretty much it. So fast forward, um, I end up selling from Zoom, and then I, I well I couldn't sell from Zoom. I was setting appointments for Zoom, and then I was like, you know what? I'm I need to figure this out. I'm gonna take massive activity, and uh, I'm gonna drive two and a half hours from my house. And uh, go in home, set two appointments. Then uh, I set three appointments that day. It was a Thursday, I remember. Drove two and a half hours, sat in the first home, was there for an hour and a half. Um, ended up making a huge mistake. The client got sent to underwriting, but I forgot. I, I clicked cash on delivery, which means I didn't. I, I took all the bank account information, but the application didn't ask for it. And uh, I remember it got sent to underwriting. And that sucked. Uh, he ended up getting approved, but then it didn't draft because we didn't set up for drafting and hard lesson to learn. 
and then went to my next home, was there for five and a half hours, uh, sent him through six different companies. They all got declined. So we ended up going whole life, got him approved um, later, like maybe a week or two later. And uh, that was the story of my first sales. And then what ended up happening was actually, uh, it was two, it was, it was later that day. So that was two apps. So we did like 4,500. Two, and then later that day, I ended up selling another policy um, that go, got sent to underwriting, ended up getting approved, which is awesome. So long story short, that was the, that was the start of my insurance space. But um, one thing that that I wanted to talk with you about uh, or talk at least at least a little bit on this subject is like the uh, just getting a jump start in the industry. And it starts with like in the pre-licensing phase. So what would you say like are some good things that people need to do when they're they're in the pre-licensing stage? Yeah, I mean, this is because exactly a lot of people overthink it. <laughs> It, I was one of those people, man. I was one of those people. And it's kind of embarrassing for me to look at now, right? Because I recommend that everybody, you know, just set a date for a test and just hammer down on that information. Study How long did it take the... you? Dude, like two months, probably. Like I studied that forever. Like I thought this was going to be some massive thing that like I had to know the ins and outs of every single thing I was going to be doing. And yep, it's just not the case. And the, the, yeah, getting licensed is just the first hurdle you're going to have to face. And it doesn't have to be as, as crazy as people think. It's the biggest piece of advice is like, you know, set a, set a test date for two, three weeks out, study your material really hard, you know, do the boring work. If you're working another job, like hammer it out at night. And if you don't pass the first time, like it's okay. I didn't pass. Did you pass your first time? No, dude, I didn't either. I, I went in, I think I failed it by like probably a couple of questions, but man, that had me riled up. I was pissed off. You know, I thought I knew everything. As soon as I got to the car, I bam, bam, scheduled another test and went the next day and passed it. Like it's okay. It's okay. Not to pass your first time. Most agents don't. Yep. And, and it really sets the tone on, on, um, uh on how your time in the industry is going to go, right? Because a lot of people get excited, they get motivated, they get inspired. They're like, sold the dream. Um, and we could talk about that at some point uh, in this podcast, but or at some time. But dude, like having, it sets the tone for everything. Because if you're not, if you're not going to do the consistent things that you need to do, if you're not going to um, take massive action, like this is just the first barrier of entry. And I'm glad that you have to go through a pre-licensing phase because this just shows like, hey, this is what hard is. This is what hard feels like. This is exactly what it looks like. So are you actually going to do it or not? Are you going to push through it or not? Like if you can't pass a test um, and really do the things that feel irrelevant at that point, how how do you how do I know that you're going to try to drill all the objections? How do I know that you're going to follow your script and study that? How do I know that you're going to study the call recordings? hours and hours and hours at a time. How do I know you're going to do all these, those things? And so that's the, the, some of the questions I'm asking. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It definitely sets the tone for how your business is going to go. How it, you know, you can, you can tell if you recruit somebody and you send them through pre-licensing, how they tackle that pre-licensing and actually taking the test in a timely fashion yeah. and really, really sees how they're going to perform as an agent for sure. Yeah. Super important. So, um, so pre-licensing, make sure that you, uh, you get that fully ready to rock and roll. Um, and you just take it, take it as many times as you need. Um, and nothing's going to prepare you like actually doing it. So that's just a lesson that you can take to be successful in insurance is like, you just got to take imperfect action, be okay to fail, fail forward. And, uh, not many people that I know get it like actually pass their test the first time. <laughs> And uh, if I hear that they pass the test the first time, it kind of puts some um, red flags in my head. <laughs> as crazy as that might sound, because either you just might think that that's going to translate into actually selling insurance. And it's not like, hey, follow the text. It's like you have to actually learn this stuff and have some street knowledge in, in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely street knowledge. So what, what do you think the next, the next step somebody should take is after they get their license? Dude, you have to, you have to like, well, one, find a mentor, find an agency. I mean, we should talk about that a little bit. Like you have to find a good mentor, a good agency, a good leads, like good leads to actually work. 
um, and know that there's a system and process in place to be able to be successful, right? So what, what does that actually look like? Well, make sure that you're getting a comp over 100%. That's the number one thing to be able to find. At least if you're paying for leads, have to be over a hundred percent. Now, if you're but if you're getting free leads, um, make sure that the the uh, the comp the comp structure is actually really good and it actually has um, people that are making ten thousand a month, right? If they're selling the dream of making ten thousand a month on free leads, like ask like how many people of your guys are doing it, right? If they follow your process day in and day out, are they actually doing it? Or are they making less than a thousand bucks a week? Like, what's that actually look like, right? So. Uh, what's the on track earnings, right? So, so figuring that out for your free leads, uh, how many leads am I going to be able to work? What, what are average people doing? What's it actually look like? Um, so on and so forth. Um, so that's free leads. Um, that, that comp plan I, really is going to vary. I think a lot of people too, um, you know, as soon as you get your license, I'm not sure if you remember this, but it, man, you get a ton of phone calls by recruiters and, you got to yeah. <laughs> be like leery of, of who you end up going with. Do you, do your due diligence, like investigate different agencies, like figure out the model you want to work. You know, I, I'm yeah. personally not a fan, but if you want to go with like a more MLM model that, you know, it's solely based off recruiting and that's how you move comp structure and so on and so forth, you know, do your due diligence on them and see how that looks. If you want to go more like the independent route that's focused on personal production and you can also build a team. I mean, like I said, do your due diligence. I think, I mean, shout out to David Dufour, but I think I got this from him, but he has a video where he talks about, you know, interview three, four, five different agencies Yep. and compare them and see what it looks like long-term. And if yep. you're seriously considering them, like I like to get personal. I don't like to work with people that don't share the same kind of values as I share the same morals. Um, and interview some of their top producers, ask who their top producers are. I probably wouldn't have them introduce me probably i would ask some of the names just because to be oh, honest geez. i would some people aren't transparent and you know they can be in on it with the upline or the agency owner and fill you full of bull crap <laughs> about how much yep. money they're making i would probably ask a few different people who are producing at a top level reach out to them on your own and maybe ask them a few questions about how profitable they are how much they spend on leads What's the comp look like? What's the environment yep. look like? What's and, the culture like? Um, I mean, there, yeah. there's a lot of people that sell the dream of making money, but if you're not in alignment spiritually, emotionally, relationally, like it's just not a good, it, it, it could really turn ugly quick. Uh, and especially if they're trying to make you do stuff that you don't want to do, um, telling you to, to do things that you might feel like is is not in alignment with what you want. That's really important. So like there there are fits out there that will allow you to be financially aligned, but also like and very aggressive in that end, but also like they do, they, they do promote or, or believe or, or think that relationship with God is important, right? Family is important. So finding that balance, you definitely can. Um, but it, it, you just have to interview different people. And I wouldn't go with the first person that you find, right? Like I would actually look at what else is out there. Do your research, look up YouTube videos, figure out exactly what's what's the good and the bad. And also take take the, take some salt from it, right? Like you, you don't want to take everything that you see at face value. You want to like say, hey, I'm going to take some of that. Maybe some of it's true. Maybe it's not. And uh, overall, like, what am I hearing about this certain thing? Are they good or they're bad? Whatever it is, because on transparently, if you're big and you're growing an agency, there's probably going to be bad stuff about you. I mean, that that's just the reality. Or uh, yeah, bad things if you really look hard and to dig and dig and dig. But overall, what's this person's reputation? What what are they like? Um, what's the agency like? What are they? Are the the people actually seeing success in it? Um, so those are really great questions to ask. Yeah. And one last thing I'd like to touch on about an agency that you join is, uh, and I really like your feedback on it, Johnny, but you know, what should they niche down on? Like, should they start with IULs? It's like an agency that, you know, does IULs term final expense mortgage protection. Like, yeah. What do you think best for a new agent? to? Kind that's of, a, that's you know, a great question to be honest. And I would say like, you want to make sure that you're finding a, an agency that's most likely doing simplified issue business. If you're just getting brand new, cash flow is king. I remember my first month and a half into the business, I was like, 
I was all into mortgage protection and then my I see my uplines, right? And you naturally are going to do it or you're going to want to do what somebody's doing rather than what they're saying. So they're like, just focus on term and give me those leads of annuities and IULs. And then they're talking about how much money they're making from them and how like they're trashing it essentially. Like, hey, you can make a ton of money. That's the goal. You want to work retirement leads, yada, 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 X, Y, Z, whatever. And it's like the truth of it all is like, if the person's not doing what they're saying to do, then I would question it. Like, what's kind of the the main reason here? Why are you not right? Like, why are you why are you telling me to do mortgage protection and you're doing IULs and annuities? Which it may make sense at that point, right? But there was n there's no like there's no overall like nobody's telling me exactly why. So I'm just kind of confused, and it created a lot of confusion for me. And so then it killed my cash flow. I spent $4,000 on annuity leads. And it's like, I barely, I didn't know how to sell. So of course I'm going to run these appointments horribly. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things too, is like when you're first joining the industry, like don't try to be a jack of all trades. Yep. Like you don't need to know how to sell annuities term final expense, like right off the bat, like, you know, riches are in the niches, especially whenever you first start. Once you have experience and you want to learn how to present IULs or, mortgage protection, whatever that looks like for you. It's like, you can address it at that point, but whenever you're brand new and you're taking on so much information, you're trying to learn scripts, like you're uncomfortable dialing the phone or even giving a presentation. It's really key. And I thought it was for me just to, to niche down, focus on final expense or mortgage protection and not try to do them all at once. Yeah, 100%. And that's like super crucial. And I think like when you are getting started, you don't have a lot of data and you don't have a lot of feedback. So you want to take massive action, right? Like we're, we're talking about um, how to like win at insurance sales and it's doing, you got to get to a place that you're doing the right thing as my camera just goes out. You got to get to the spot where you're doing the right thing, but you don't see results and being okay with that. And it's an interesting concept because typically like you're, you're not doing the right thing if you're not getting the results, but it's a lot of times you're not going to see the results right away and that's okay. But like, you have to be okay dialing 300 times, not getting any or getting feedback and, and getting tons of objections. Like I would rather have somebody do that than like not do anything at all. I'd rather them get a ton of objections because then they'll actually know exactly what they need to do to be successful. Then they'll actually know exactly what they need to work on. But if you're not getting any feedback at all, it's it's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah, and I think that moves into the early like the next thing that we need to look at. And it's you found the agency, they align with your values, but it's like what lead source are you working? Now, some agencies they may have a good lead source, but maybe they don't have enough of them to support the amount of agents that they're recruiting. Yeah. You may be restricted on the amount that you're gonna get. And what type you work, really, I mean, it, it really, it depends on where you're going to go. If you're doing mortgage protection, obviously, King is probably, you know, going to be mailers, like direct mail leads. That's yeah. probably always going to be King for mortgage protection. But if you're doing final expense, what, what would you recommend for agents that are going to be focusing on final expense? What kind of leads should they be looking for or wanting to be working? I mean... If you're doing final expense more or final expense in, in term simplified issue type things, I would definitely go self-generated leads, especially if you're selling over the phone. And even if you're not like uh, uh, Facebook leads, like can actually be really good for in-person as well. We actually have an agent that we work with Gonzalo um, in our community uh, that we have. And, and he's, he's, cr he crushes the in-person, right? He sells typically over the phone, but in person, like he's a dog, which is awesome. Right. And so like having those types of people, um, that can, like, I, I highly recommend being able to do that because you're able to get high, like high quality leads at low cost. And the goal is volume. You want to have a ton of volume of leads, especially when you're just starting out because you're not going to be good. It's like, imagine paying a hundred bucks per lead and you're forced to close one out of two or one out of three or one out of four to actually be profitable. It's like, is it even worth it at that point? Because you're not even good at selling right? You could trip on a Facebook lead and all of a sudden you close one, right? Augustine, I remember his, his second day dialing, he closes a deal and it's because he stumbled upon a good client. Um, and that's what happens when you're generating leads. He spent, I don't know, like 30 bucks at that point and he closed a deal. 
um, and he never sold anything before in his life. So if you're able to, to have a volume, Chase is another example or is an example too. Like you can work quality and he was working leads that were 45 or 40 to 45 bucks a piece. And all of a sudden his calendar is more full with more leads and he's spending less or spending at least the same because he's able to have way more people to talk to. And so that's, what's cool about having that plus the AI system plus um, like having a local presence styler is like you have a full system in place set up for you that like when the volume comes through, you don't even have to work them like crazy. He di only dials his leads three times typically. And he moves on to the next one. He dials fresh people and he's closing one to two, three deals a day consistently. Yeah. I mean, he, he lowered his lead cost significantly. I mean, he's probably spending, you know, an eighth of what he was on one lead. But for a new agent that's coming into the business, you know, obviously they're learning a lot of things. They're trying to learn how to sell. They're practicing their scripts. You know, generating your own leads could be a massive mountain on its own. What what would you recommend for people to kind of get started in that field and learn how to generate their own leads? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a ton of different things that you could do um, that could work. Um, you could do it yourself. You could hire somebody to do it. You could, I mean, transparently, there's so many different things that you could actually like do. Um, but, uh, what I'd recommend, um, doing if I was like a, a new agent, um, is I would, I would, um, I would hire somebody to do it and like, just have them do it for me. Cause if something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. So might as well just do it right and do it the first time. Right. So that's what I highly recommend doing. Um, if I'm a new insurance agent, um, is, is that transparently, mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just run that up. And then if you, if you have to like work age leads, like that's, that's another option too, because age leads are going to really help you, um, get a lot of feedback and to be able to dial a lot of numbers because you can build habits with that. You might not see the results that you're thinking right away on age leads with that's totally okay. But it's imagine spend spending 200 bucks to get a hundred age leads. And all of a sudden, boom, you make a sale on that. You're able to, you're, you, all you need is one to be profitable and make money. Um, and so when you're starting out, you want to be able to get the leads that are going to give you the most amount of the ability to, to sell the most amount of insurance, like uh, dial the most, to be able to dial the most and, and be able to get the most activity because activity is everything. You don't have a ton of, you don't have skills. So you have to just do act pure volume and activity and volume will negate luck volume will allow you to get better at skill and more skilled and get feedback so you can know exactly what you need to do to really be successful so let's kind of move in i mean like let's say we get an agent and maybe they're writing five ten thousand a month you know they're profitable they're not spending a ton on leads like how, how do you really recommend an agent to scale up to the ten twenty thousand dollar month mark at that point you know, they're already rock and rolling. They know their script. You know, they're just not able to move past, you know, 10,000 a month. Yeah, um, that that's a, a great question, right? Um, and I think like you, the first thing you want to do um, to really like start seeing success is having cons obviously consistent lead flow um, and getting consistent data, right? And like, that's the number one thing that you want to do. But then once you start getting better at that, like before we even get into that, we need to talk about so much more in terms of getting really good at, at your script, getting good yeah. at, at objections. Like, let's talk about that because when somebody comes in and they don't know what to do, they need, like the first thing that you should do is memorize your script. <laughs> Like there's so many agents that we work with that don't know their script, like the back of their hand, like know your script, know and understand that exactly front end and back end. What else do you feel like besides knowing the script or what do you, what, what's good for an agent to do to be able to get the script really good? I mean, personally, what I recommend, like when they first come in, a lot of people will just try to read it in their head, which I, I can't stand that. Like if you're yep. just going to read the script in your head, you're not going to learn it. Um, I recommend them read it, you know, five to 10 times out loud coming out of their mouth. Cause it doesn't matter what it sounds like in your head. It matters what it sounds like when you actually say it and what people will hear whenever you do it over the phone. Yep. That point when you're feeling kind of comfortable with it and you know, the tonality and you know, the things you're supposed to be doing around that, you know, seventh to 10th time, probably take a recording and then 
listen to that recording over and over and over again like you're a madman like a lot of people they don't they don't do enough of the boring work i think we can both attest like whenever we were trying to learn our script we didn't listen to anything we didn't listen to music we didn't listen to podcasts it was solely just recordings of ourselves, <laughs> so it would burn into our brain um and it sucks most people just don't want to embrace the suck and those are the people that usually fail out of the business. People that can endure, you know, that crappy situation the longest are the ones that usually see the most success. Yeah. So just get comfortable doing the boring work. Yeah. So once you get the script really rocking and rolling, you're on the phones. I would write down every objection that you get. Every single every objection you get, I would write it down over and over and over and over and over again. Um, everything that you get, right? I'm too busy. I already got it taken care of. I didn't fill that out. Um, I've already gotten so many people calling me. Stop calling me. Take me off your list. Um, that the coverage is too high. I can't afford it. I need to think about it. I need to talk to my wife. Like any objection that you literally are going to get, I would write it down because you're going to see a pattern in terms of what objections you're going to get. And they typically fall into a bunch of different, like two to three different categories, right? You're going to have your front obje end objections, you're going to have your back end objections and you're going to have a middle objection that you might get of like, how long is this going to take? What's the price? Da, 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 da. And so once you get that, once you have them all written out, then I would start practicing them and get a role play partner, get somebody that you can actually role play with and actually like, Hey, hit me with this objection. And so I know exactly what to say and how to say it. And so in our school community, I'll drop it in the description um, we're actually, I'm going to give away all these, this, the, the word tracks, right? Exactly what to say, how to say it. Um, and that, that's, that's a, and at the end of the day, what, what happens there, um, and which and is if you don't have a word track for objections, guys, like this may be super old school, but I did this whenever I first got in the industry, like every single person that I would get on the phone, I would write their name down and then the outcome of the call. So if it was, you know, I want to think about it, or I already got this taken care of. I knew every single person I talked to and the objection they gave me. So at the end of my day, I knew what I needed to train on. And I would hammer those objections, you know, figure out how not to get. And I want to think about it at the end, figure out how to overcome a banking objection, whatever that really looked like. Yep. But I knew what I needed to practice on because those were, were what I was getting at the moment. For sure. And you have to, right? Like that's what you have to do over and over and over and over and over again, right? Tracking data. Um, so Tracking. yeah so so once we get that you get the scripting you get the role playing which was cool is like this we we know exactly what an agent needs to do to be successful right like we help that we do this on a day-to-day -day basis we we help agents in our community in our paid community um really do this themselves i mean we have like seven different trainings a week now um that people can plug into marketing like anything that you want to have in marketing we have that answered like a Q and a, we have a marketing course. We have a sales training course. We have what we have uh role plays. We have call reviews. We have support calls. Um, we literally have everything you need. We have dial rooms, right? So we have everything you need to be successful because we've gone through the pain of not understanding what this looks like. We've gone through the pain of, of not having consistent lead flow coming in. We've had the problem, like all this stuff, like we solve for you guys. So all you got to do is literally just plug in and play, which is cool. And um, that that's that's really what it comes down to, right? And so, um, so once you learn to overcome objections and you're getting some feedback there, and now we're we're given full on presentations. I mean, obviously that creates a lot of anxiety for most agents when they're brand new. How do you think they overcome that the fastest? It, it, say that one more time. Sorry, I had a an agent that just reached out to me and is like, I'm ready to join your community. That's what I was, I was trying to figure out. What, what were we saying? <laughs> a little distraction. Yeah. yeah so, you know, mo most uh, insurance agents, whenever they're brand new, it's, you know, they've learned the, they've learned the script, they practice the objections, and it's yeah. time to hop off presentations. And it usually creates a lot of anxiety because they've never done this with a random stranger before. What do you think the biggest tips on, you know, getting comfortable giving presentations would be? You go out and do 50 presentations. I mean, that that's the advice I was given. Honestly, it's really good because you're going to have enough feedback and data to be able to understand what you're doing right and wrong. And then once you do that track, and I cannot tell you guys to do this enough, 
track your data, track your metrics, right? And so we can actually give give away um, a tracker that we have um, that we do. We'll we'll leave it down below as well um, to be able to go check out that if you're not tracking your data, hit, hey, plug in. This is a, a good sheet to be able to use that we use um, and our agents in the community use um, to be able to track your numbers, right? You want to track your deposits every day. You want to make sure that that is tracked every single day on a consistent basis, right? Your dials, contacts, appointments, numbers, whatever it is, right? You also want to track your deposits. You want to check your bank account every morning, get in the habit of doing that every single day. When I'm trying to work out and really get my fitness in check, right? And as both of us have been trying to lose weight and, and really going after our fitness a lot, weigh yourself every morning. It's a good way to be conscious of what you're trying to do and, and get in alignment with your goals and remind yourself of, of how you want to eat today, right? Same thing with this. And then after that, there's another thing you want to track is like um, what presentations you do. How many presentations you do and also what was the result of each presentation are you selling are you getting a think about it are you getting a partner objection is it too high whatever it is and then whatever objections you're getting that's what we need to know and we're, we're able to actually see what problem are we trying to solve and we're able to help them yeah i think one thing too it's getting the mindset right whenever you're gonna dial you know a lot of these people are afraid that they're gonna answer the phone and you know be rude to them and they can't handle the the you know pushback that they get it creates a lot of anxiety and they're scared to dial the phone again and what i tell everybody is like it's just a phone call like this is just a phone call yep chances are guys if you get on the phone and they yell at you like you're never ever talking to this person again so it doesn't matter like it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you bomb the first few presentations, if you weren't very good, if you didn't perform at the level that you'd like to be at because it gets better and you get better over time. So remove the emotion. Don't let, you know, angry, grumpy old people like <laughs> kill your whole day. Like really just, and this, this works in all aspect of business. Just remove the emotion from it and look at it from the outside in. And just do the boring work. Like, yeah, you, you yeah, it, it's a lot of this business can be simplified down. A lot of people overthink everything we're doing. The business is simple, but it's not easy. You got to yep. do the boring work. You got to do the stuff that sucks. Yeah. But it's simple. You have to. And and it's at first, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. And, and it's practically like, what does this look like? Right. Like, how do you actually take the emotion out of it? And it's tracking your numbers will allow you to do that. Like yeah, tracking your numbers, look at, you don't, you can't remove the emotion because you're stuck in that loop Yep. because you have no feedback to play on. If you know that you gave 25 presentations this week, but you only closed one sale, it's like, you know, that you need to get better on your presentation. And especially if you have call recordings, if you have call recordings, it's like, you know, if you're messing it up when you're showing them numbers or if yep. you're not building strong enough, why? Um, or if you're maybe screwing up underwriting, you can look back at all that data. So yeah, I think if any if anybody takes away anything when they're first getting into the industry is always track your metrics. Yeah. Track every piece of data you can. Yeah. It allows you to be able to call strategically exactly what's going on in your business. And like you, you're able to find the, the, the holes that are, that are there in your business. That's tanking you. That's not allowing you to see the success that you want. It's, a, it's, it's, yeah, there, there's, so much with tracking your numbers that is really awesome and that you need to see success with at the end of the day. So that's really how you win at insurance, right? Track your numbers, get do massive activity, go out and do 50 presentations. Um, when you're just starting out, generate your leads. If you can, if not buy age leads, um, try not to buy from vendors. If you have to, then do it. But um, I, I would, you're just going to be throwing a lot of money away um, that you don't have to necessarily. So is there anything else that you could think of that like would help I mean, somebody win? Let's just do a quick recap, man. And uh, I think we, we covered a lot of details, but let's just do a quick recap for the new agents. You know, when you're first getting into the business and you're pre-licensing, set a date for your test. Don't be afraid to take the test too early. Just get it. Yeah. Secondly, interview multiple agencies See if they align with your values. Look at how their comp structure works and really dig deep on the people that you're going to be working with. Third is make sure you guys are going to have a good lead source. You're going to have an abundance of leads that you can be profitable on. And then fourth, just really take massive action when you're first starting in the business. Try to get through that learning curve as fast as possible. 
And fifth is just track your metrics, guys. It's the only way you're going to be able to scale your business and make the the potential money that you guys want to make. Yeah. And then also one last thing, and I, I think that we definitely need to talk about this, is one of our mentors that we, we had before, um, it's full immersion, right? Like if you want to get really good at selling, it's a language. And so the, he, he made this example. If you want to get really good at speaking Spanish, are you going to go and do the like do, do a lingo app like for, for, I don't know, five minutes a day? Or are you going to go and are you going to... To, are you going to go to Mexico, fly out there, book a one-way flight, and stay out there for six months, right? Are you going to do that? Who's who's going to be more fluent after six months? The person who goes out and fully immerses and changes their culture, changes their environment, and, and goes out and, and does that? Or are you going to do the Duolingo app for, I don't know, four years and hopefully and pray that that, that, that would work? So that's at the end of the day how the how this business is going to work. Are you going to be the person that spends five minutes a day doing it? Or are you going to fully immerse yourself and do everything in your power necessary to really succeed, to be successful, to really get to that next level? The choice is yours. A lot of people wait, but like, why not start now? Why not fully immerse yourself and give you the best opportunity necessary to succeed, to be able to help your family and your situation? Because at the end of the day, this is an opportunity that can change you and your family's life. But are you going to actually take ownership? Are you going to take control? Are you going to actually take it by the horns? Or are you going to like, I don't know, let it pass by. not do it? Yeah, let the opportunity pass by. That's it, man. That's it. Fully immerse yourself, guys. So if you haven't already, subscribe down below. Um, we're going to have new episodes every single week. Once a week, um, coming to you guys live. Um, if you have any questions, comment down below, share this with a friend if you found it valuable and, uh, I'll see you guys next week. All right. Peace.